Hi everyone and welcome back to SALT Talks. My name is Rachel Pather and I'm a Senior Advisor to Skybridge Capital based in Abu Dhabi, as well as being the MC for SALT, a thought leadership forum and networking platform that encompasses business, technology and politics. Now, as many of you know, SALT Talks is a series of digital interviews with some of the world's foremost investors, creators and thinkers. And just as we do at our Global SALT Conference series, we aim to provide our audience a window into the minds of subject matter experts. Today's focus will be on digital assets, and I can't think of anyone better to speak to on this topic than CZ, the founder of Binance, the largest cryptocurrency exchange in the world. CZ is a serial entrepreneur who launched Binance in July 2017, and within six months, grew Binance into the world's largest cryptocurrency exchange. CZ has a really great story. He's a Chinese Canadian coder who spent his youth flipping burgers before studying at McGill University in Montreal. He then spent time in Tokyo and New York, first building systems for matching trade orders, then developing software for Bloomberg's futures trading on Wall Street. In 2005, CZ quit his role as head of the Bloomberg trade book, futures research and development team, and moved to Shanghai to start his first company. Hosting today's talk will be our very own Anthony Scaramucci, the founder and managing partner of Skybridge Capital, and also the chairman of SALT. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Anthony, for the interview. Rachel, thank you so much. Uh, CZ, thank you so much for joining us. We were talking uh, just before we went live here about your background. I was hoping that you could share that with our delegation. Tell us where you grew up. Tell us what uh, got you into cryptocurrency. Um, and tell us a little bit about that story. Sure. Uh, yeah, Anthony, uh, uh, Rachel, thanks for having me here. It's a pleasure. And um, yeah, so um, I grew up in, in China um, before I was 12. So I moved in between a few different cities in China. When I was 12, uh, I moved to Canada with my parents. And um, in Canada, I stayed in Vancouver for six years for high school and then moved to Montreal for a college. And um, uh, before I graduated, I took an internship job in Tokyo um, for a software outsource company that's working for Tokyo Stock Exchange. So we're writing order matching software uh, for the Tokyo Stock Exchange. Um, so I got exposed to uh, financial software at a relatively early stage. Um, yeah, before that, as Rachel mentioned, um, in my, when I was 15, I was flipping burgers in McDonald's uh, in Vancouver. So that was also a pretty interesting experience. I also worked at, I also worked at, at a gas, gas station after that. Um, the gas station paid a lot better because I was working the night shift. But anyway, so um, after graduation, I worked in Tokyo, uh, New York, um, Singapore, Shanghai, a bit of Hong Kong. Um, uh, so kind of back and forth between uh, 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 North America and Asia. So uh, given the fact that I was traveling, so uh, I was living in different places. So I never really got married to one currency, one country, et cetera. So in 2013, when I was in Shanghai, I was playing poker with uh, Bobby Lee, who was uh, who's the ex-CEO of uh, BTC China, one, at the time, one of the, uh, uh, one of the earliest cryptocurrency exchanges. And uh, he introduced, introduced me to Bitcoin. He says, uh, CZ, you should, you, should, you should think about converting 10% of your net worth into crypto, uh, in, into Bitcoin. And um, there's a small chance you will go to zero, then you lose 10%. Um, there's a higher chance you will go 10X, then you double. Um, so given that, um, I was pretty, so I seriously looked into Bitcoin. Um, I read the white paper, um, um, uh, met a bunch of people in the, in the crypto industry. And then uh, uh, by end of 2013, I decided to leave my previous startup and to, do, to, do, to jump into cryptocurrency. And back then it was really called the Bitcoin industry uh, full time. So that's kind of how I got started into, uh, into crypto. Fantastic. So I am embarrassingly getting old, okay? And I don't like admitting that to anybody, but I know I'm old when my 28-year-old son tells me, Dad, you got to start buying Bitcoin. And he's explaining it to me. And I feel like uh, I'm explaining to my great-grandfather how to use a typewriter. So I need help. Okay, let's start, start at the beginning. Tell me why I should own cryptocurrency and which cryptocurrencies do you like and where is the future of crypto? Sure, um, I think there's a couple of different things. I think the first thing is really, um, let's just talk about, talk about Bitcoin. I believe Bitcoin is just a better form of money. Um, our current money currency systems have a lot of flaws. 
um, right now we're, we're witnessing the, probably the largest uh, amount of quantitative easing by governments all around the world. And when governments do that, everybody becomes poor because there's more currencies being printed and you're not given uh, much of that directly. Um, the ma majority, the bulk of it is going to be given to like Wall Street banks um, and to bail out other companies, etc. Um, and we don't know where it goes, but we do know that your uh, the uh, whatever 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 um, bank account numbers you have or whatever salary you're getting is getting diluted, even though the numbers don't change, but the numbers uh, the pur purchasing power will decrease. So that's one aspect of it. Uh, Bitcoin is limited supply, 21 million of them uh, ever. Um, and you can't cheat, you can't cheat that. You can, you, you know, you know, that's mathematic, mathematically guaranteed. No one can change it. Okay. So I want to stop you there. So I just want to emphasize that for everybody that knows um, as much about cryptocurrency as I do, there's no disruption in the supply table of crypto. Is that correct? Of, of Bitcoin. Is that correct? Yes, there's, a finite, yeah. there's a finite amount. Now, how do we know that? How do we know that Mr. Satoshi or Mrs. Satoshi can't uh, figure out a way to create more Bitcoin once everybody's sucked into Bitcoin? Sure. So Bitcoin is not centrally issued. It's issued by a network of computers we, uh, which follows the Bitcoin protocol. And if one computer doesn't, does not follow it, um, they, it will be rejected from the network. So it's mathematically guaranteed that uh, every four years, the new coins, um, uh, uh, the, the new coins being issued uh, decreases by half. And by 2040-ish, um, all 21 million uh, of Bitcoins will be minted. Uh, so right now, I think around 18 to 19 million Bitcoins are already minted. So the, supply, the new supplies coming up is quite, uh, is decreased. So this is guaranteed by software. Um, and um, uh, this is guaranteed by a number uh, um, thousands of or probably tens of thousands of nodes uh, running uh, Bitcoin mining software. So this is something that even the cr uh, founder, the creator of Bitcoin, Satoshi Nakamoto, or his wife, or his friends, they can't change it. So this is this is mathematically guaranteed. So this is the first time humans are able to guarantee this type of um, uh, uh, of issuance of uh, currencies using the blockchain technology, which is a core invention, of course, uh, 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 by Bitcoin, uh, by, um, by Satoshi Nakamoto. Okay, now yeah. I gotta ask you another big question. Everybody must ask you this again, but no government is backing it. There's no army backing it. There's no balance sheet of the government. The US government, as an example, owns 28% of the land in the United States. So there's probably 60 to $100 trillion of assets under that land. Uh, so when we're sitting on a $30 trillion deficit, we probably have a good asset mix. What is the backing of Bitcoin other than that computer code? Sure. Um, so uh, Bitcoin is backed by utility. So the more people who use it, uh, the more value you will have. Um, so you could say, for example, um, Facebook is not backed by anything per se. You just have a large number of users who, who use it. And if, if, if something is used by a, lot, a large number of users, then you have value. So uh, Bitcoin has utility. Uh, it, it has many use cases where the current, uh, the current, uh, the current currency system does not uh, work well. So uh, the quantitative easing is one aspect of it. Uh, if you think about transferring value from, uh, from one country to another, let's say from US to China or, or vice versa, um, there's usually a lot of difficulties in, uh, in doing that. So uh, Bitcoin is a way for people to potentially transfer a wealth or, or, or value across the globe uh, from anywhere to anywhere um, uh, on their own uh, using the, following the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the protocol. So um, it, ha it has a lot of other use cases where uh, today's uh, currencies uh, are not able to, uh, to do. So given the high amount of utility, it has value. So it's, it, the value is generated that way. Okay, but the, the federal government of the United States, the Treasury Department and the Federal Reserve, what is to stop them from digitizing a currency and making it a massive competitor of something like Bitcoin and bigfooting it? Or China's digitizing the RENMB. Tell us why we should still like Bitcoin. Sure. So um, any uh, any government or, or the, the the feds or any any authority can issue uh, a digital currency, even using the blockchain technology. Um, but there's a few other properties that are that are quite important here. Um, uh, is that uh, you can use the blockchain technology to issue a currency that's still on limited supply. So is the supply of the currency limited, uh, guaranteed by the protocol? 
uh, most central most central bank issued currencies will have unlimited supply. So we we have the we have the old problem of uh, more and more quantitative easing, and more and more of those things, those currency will be minted, and the previous holders of those currencies will be, get diluted in value. So that's uh, so if governments are able are, are willing to issue a, a fixed supply currency that they will no longer dilute that. With, uh, with no future quantitative easing, then you will you will you will match up on that uh, property uh, or on that advantage of Bitcoin. Um, the second thing is, um, would governments uh, still block you from uh, doing certain transfers? For example, if you want to send your cousin or your friend, um, I, I don't know, in in the Philippines, uh, um, say I don't know, you want to buy a house in in the Philippines, it costs I don't know a million dollars or something. Can you send that with ease very quickly without too many uh, middleman intervention, without a lot of approval processes? So how easy that process is to how easy that currency is to uh, is to use? With Bitcoin, there's no intermediary. Uh, no one's going to block you. Um, it's guaranteed to work. Um, so uh, is those is so basically fundamentally still comes down to um, the is it limited supply? Does it have a high degree of freedom of transfer uh, or usage? And uh, is it cheap to do? Is it cheap to use? So, for example, if you send, if you if you use banks to send a large amounts of money, you, the fees are probably going to be pretty high. So, it still comes down to those basic properties. Uh, so, governments can issue uh, a digital currency, but uh, if the governments can issue a currency that's limited supply, uh, cheaper to transfer, and not so many restrictions on that, then I think I think you will you will be able to compete with Bitcoin. Uh, but if that's not the case, then Bitcoin uh, we will, we will uh, people will evaluate. Evaluate the advantages and disadvantages. So we have, so we have Facebook, to see. Facebook was trying to put out something called Libra, a digital yeah. currency, and uh, for some reason they didn't do it. Uh, what happened there? The government got in their face or something and and threatened them. What happened there? Um, I think the uh, I think what you described is probably the sort of a common way to describe it. But I think it's still happening. Uh, it happened. Happened. It hasn't happened yet. But it's also not. Uh, it's not. They didn't. Uh, as far as I understand, I understand they didn't cancel the project. It just takes time to roll out a new, uh, new digital digital currency. So um, that's my understanding of it. I don't really know a lot of details, but um, um, that's that's my understanding. Okay. Um, let me ask. You, I mean, yeah, obviously, I'm very fascinated by this. I hope you don't mind these. Uh, these are probably basic questions for you, but I think it's important. No for, we have so many people that are going to listen to this that don't know a lot about this. So. Bitcoin is the Google of digital currency or is it the Yahoo of digital currency? Is there going to be another currency that comes up over the top of Bitcoin? Uh, so, um, so I think today Bitcoin is definitely the, the uh, Bitcoin is definitely the most dominant by far uh, a cryptocurrency that's available and it's also the most decentralized. So big in the industry, we say Bitcoin is king. Um, so, but, um, uh, but, uh, to your point, though, um, anyone can issue any digital currency, and um, the industry there's a lot there's many innovative people in the industry that's uh, creating new uh, new digital currencies. Um, I I believe Bitcoin will be leading the way for a very for a very long time to come for the foreseeable future. But in the longer future, is not um, the possibility of some something overtakes Bitcoin, something better that comes along uh, is totally possible. So anything is possible. Um, but I think what's, wh whatever is going to overtake Bitcoin will have to be better. Um, so in the longer future, I think that's definitely possible. But would that still mean that Bitcoin would still be used, or that would put book, would that would cause Bitcoin to start devaluing? Uh, that's uh, so um, we don't know. Uh, both both scenarios are possible. So for example, if there's Bitcoin 2.0, that's better than Bitcoin 1.0. People may slowly shift from 1.0 to 2.0. And then they, uh, if there are two different coins, um, then one, one coin will devalue over time, the other coin will increase in value in time. But right now, um, or it could be something that's, uh, I don't know, um, some other coin, this, like there's literally millions, mi millions of other coins uh, on the market. One of them may get really wide adoption and people will shift to, towards that. Um, so the thing with decentralized uh, to uh, currencies is that um, there's a very large community of people around that already. So the shift you will now go from like I don't know fifteen hundred dollars to uh, fifteen thousand dollars to zero in one day. The shift will be will be somewhat gradual, but right now. Um, we are still at the very beginning of the Bitcoin journey, I believe. So we're still seeing like rapid growth of Bitcoin. So um, what, is, what, is, what do you think Bitcoin will be worth in U.S. dollars in five years? 
Oof, um, that's a really, really tough. Uh, so um, yeah, my, uh, I cannot, yeah. So um, I'm not able to make those kind of predictions. And even if I try, I would be wrong. Um, so but I, I'm very bullish on Bitcoin. Big bucks though, CZ, right? I'm, I'm paid the big bucks to ask you this. So go ahead. <laughs> Where does it worth in a year? What about a year from now? Well, I think right now it's, 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 it's right now it's about $15,000 $15, per Bitcoin. And that's like already 5X uh, compared to like March where, where it was $3,000. So um, just in the last, I don't know, eight months, you've, you've, grown, you've, gone, uh, you've probably quadrupled uh, uh, close to um, 5X. So, um, you know, year time, I, yeah, it's, I, yeah it's, very, very, it's very hard to guess. But um, when you say a specific time and then <laughs> estimate, uh, predict at that time what the price will be, it's really, really difficult. But I'm, over, over the long run, I'm very bullish on Bitcoin. I think it, ha- it still has a lot of room to grow. Um, just some small data point. The industry today probably has 50 to 100 million users. That's probably th- uh, less than 0.1% of the population. So we've still probably got 1,000x to grow just on, that, uh, just on that metric. And also a new technology, a new form of currency that's better than the fiat currencies we have will have a wider audience. It will have more use cases. It's like Uber has more use cases than taxis. So Uber's market cap is not limited by the taxi market cap. So Bitcoin in that sense, I believe will be bigger than the currencies combined uh, in the world t- today. So I'm very, very bullish on it. Okay, so you founded Binance three and a half years ago, June of 2017. And within six months, it becomes the largest cryptocurrency exchange in the world. And this is a title that you still hold today. So what is the mission of Binance? Tell us about your experience there and what is your vision? Sure. So uh, Binance's mission has never been to run a largest centralized exchange. So that, that was, yes, one of our goals to try to achieve. Um, but we actually, uh, it surprised us that we achieved that so quickly. Um, but uh, our mission is really just to increase the freedom of money. So today, I think we have freedom of speech in certain countries to some extent. Uh, we have freedom of data uh, or information to some extent w- with the internet in most countries. And um, we got us to, we have freedom of press, freedom of freedom from slavery. So anytime when uh, our society, when humans are able to increase that freedom without sacrificing other things, uh, our civilization advances. Today, our money is not that free. So if, uh, as I mentioned before, if you want to transfer a large, transfer a large amount, of, amount of money from here to there, um, there's a lot of questions asked um, and you have to pay a lot of taxes, et cetera. Um, so there's a lot of in, uh, intermediary, uh, intermediaries that want to intervene. So I think we can, we can increase uh, the freedom of money today without sacrificing sa- security, safety, ease of use. And we, in, in fact, we can increase in ease of use. So that's kind of our sort of a grand vi- uh, mission. So anything we can do in this space, uh, we, will, we, uh, we will try to do. So with this vision, we kind of, um, uh, with this mission, we kind of just uh, went with a centralized exchange first. Um, and uh, somehow users really like our products and, um, and the demand was high and it just grow, uh, it just grown really quickly. So, um, but in the, in the sort of longer term, uh, we, do, we do want to build multiple other products that uh, we think will help increase the freedom of money for people all around the world. Um, and we think this is the, well, I personally think this is the best way that we can help uh, society and help, our, uh, help other people. You're on to something, Peter Thiel, who I, I got to know in 2016, said something to me about crypto. He said, Anthony, crypto is libertarian. Crypto is about freedom. AI, artificial intelligence, is about centralization. And he said that governments will use AI to check up on their citizens and to evaluate them and to offer them social scores and so forth. And But crypto is the diffusion of that sort of power. What do you say to the that thought from Peter Thiel? Um, well, I respect Peter Thiel quite a lot and I would have to agree with that statement probably. Um, I'm not an expert on AI. Um, I don't really have a lot of view, but yes, we uh, with AI, the uh, there's only a few players with big data, uh, with lots of data that, that, will, that will win. Um, so some of the bigger players in, in, uh, in the internet space will already have those advantages. Well, um, blockchain technology and cryptocurrencies is really uh, a, the other, yes, is coming from the grassroots angle where um, it, uh, it, is, it is much more decentralized and much better uh, for the decentralization of power, decentralization of control. Um, I, I personally think that that will, be, that will give us much better, give, give us a much better future um, for, for us to move, to move into. 
Um, so yeah, I'm not a I'm not an expert on AI, AI to be to be very frank. So um, I would I would uh, um, but I would go with Peter Thiel on that one for sure. You you have a venture capital part of your ecosystem. What sort of investments are you looking to make? Um, so most of the investments we make are going to be in the crypto space. So 80% of them are going to be in the crypto space, probably clo today closer to uh, anything that's infrastructure related for crypto. So uh, anything that helps exchanges, um, faster blockchains, better wallets, better security infrastructure. Um, so sort of building the, building the foundations of the, of the crypto industry. And 20% uh, of them are just out there. We invest in all kind of random projects as well, um, kind of um, uh, moonshots, crazy, crazy stuff. Also, sometimes even in traditional industries. Um, for example, we look at we even look at banks to see, hey, can we can we get a bank to work more more closely with the crypto industry? So uh, yeah, so we invest mostly in the crypto industry, but it's still a little bit outside as well. Do you, do you have a uh, feeling about? the central banking system and its concern about something like this circumventing their ability to create monetary easing and their ability to do quantitative easing. And do you think there'll be a backlash, a coordinated central government backlash? Um, I think the poss possibility is definitely there. Um, I don't. I don't really know how central banks think, um, and I'm not really them. So, um, but I think the poss possibility is definitely there. But at the same time, I think um, um, uh, a cryptocurrency uh, is already relatively wi wi widely adopted. It's uh, a Bitcoin cryptocurrency is a concept. You can't erase that concept from people's mind. So as soon as so like today, if governments don't like the internet, they can try to shut it down together. But there will be Internet 2.0 or, or the next version of it. Um, so once the concept is out, um, uh, now the collective human population have uh, uh, there's enough people in the human population who understands this now. So it can't be deleted or erased. So there's always going to be some uh, some uh, uh, some pr um, there may be some pressure or conflicts or, or race between the two. But I think uh, instead, I, I actually think the reverse, the best way for centralized, uh, for central banks or government to, um, to push, to, uh, to sort of slow down the adoption of Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies is to make the current fiat currencies um, to do less quantitative easing and to make it cheaper, cheaper to use, easier to use, less restrictions. So I think that's, the be that's a better way to compete rather than say, hey, look, if you're a bookstore, you just want to compete with Amazon by holding your fort, that's not going to work. It's much better to adopt the new, adopt the new technology innovations. OK, I'm going to turn it over to Rachel. I know Rachel has some questions for you. I have so many questions, and that was such a Great chat, so thanks so much for that. And I think, CZ, your mission to increase the freedom of money is really admirable. Um, you know, you mentioned you've obviously been in the crypto market for quite some time. You mentioned at the end of 2013, you invested 10% into digital currency. I guess back then, you know, it wasn't as highly traded as it is now. Like, did that volatility scare you or how did you feel when you made that first investment? Um, yeah, so um, I, I do have a pretty interesting story there. So it, instead of uh, just going in 10%, so by uh, at the end of 2013, actually at the beginning of 2014, I sold my house, uh, quit my job, um, put all the proceeds into from the from the house into uh, well my apartment. Uh, uh, so put all of that money into crypto, uh, into Bitcoin. So I went all in. Instead of 10%, I went like basically 100%. And I and I started looking for a new job as well, uh, in the crypto industry. And also, um, so I found a job pretty quickly, so luckily, but then the Bitcoin price, when I got in, it was around 600 US dollars. Uh, within about three or four months or so, you dropped to about $200 and stayed there for about two years. So um, so I, I experienced that. Um, so basically I lost two thirds of a house right away, uh, uh, unrealized loss. Um, I still hold those Bitcoins to, uh, to, uh, today. So um, yeah, so that was my first, well, that was my experience with Bitcoin. It took a couple of years to, for you to recover. Um, so yeah, it's not, it's not easy. It's, it's, it's definitely not easy and definitely not without thrill. Not many people would have the capacity to stomach that kind of loss, especially given it was so much of your personal wealth at that time. Was it just this kind of belief in the, I guess, what Bitcoin stood for that kept you holding on? I mean, most people would have, would have packed up their bags and left at that point. 
Yeah, so uh, I mean, I understood, I understood Bitcoin pretty well at that point. I just I knew it's the, I knew it's going to be the it's going to be the future. So uh, whatever. So I had a very strong belief, and I was working in the industry already. So I was um, I, um, so I'm fully immersed. So uh, for me, and also I I also know my risk tolerance, even though like that's my hundred percent my net worth at the time, pretty much. And but I was uh, I had a I had, a, uh, I, had I had a job, and that was paying relatively okay. So my living standard didn't decrease that much. Um, it's just mentally, it is a it is a very pressured moment. Uh, my relatives were were all like, oh, my mom wants to spank me on the head, saying like, <laughs> "You stupid kid." Uh, uh, so, um, so th so there's a lot of uh, social pressure from that perspective. But um, I I I I had I had the confidence that crypto will will, will be the future. And to the uh, and once you dropped below fifty percent, to me it was like, if I sell now, it's not even worth it. Um, I might I might as well just just hold on to it, and, and I don't have enough additional money to buy in to 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 average down, so I I just I just held on to it. So um, yeah, but uh, luckily in about a year and a, uh, almost two years, I think by the beginning of uh, 2016, uh, things really started coming back. Uh, so at end of 2015 it started to recover. Uh, so or for a year and a half it was just really dropping. So I did have to go through that period and. Uh, so I do understand when people get stressed out on Twitter and trying to like um, and 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 being very impolite, etc. So I understand that very very clearly now. Yeah, and now I guess the beauty of hindsight, right? You must be very happy that you held on to those purchased uh, bitcoins at six hundred dollars. Uh, you so, also mentioned in your discussion with Anthony that this this supply limit of twenty one million was guaranteed almost by the software. But what would happen? I think you said twenty. 40 is when they'll all be mined. Is there a risk that computing power could substantially increase in that time and actually more can be mined? Or do you see this as a very firm ceiling for the supply? Sure, it's, it's a very, very firm, firm ceiling. So it's not impacted by computing power. When the computing power increases, um, the difficulty also increases. So the supply is, is fixed, is mathematically fixed. Um, it's kind of, hard, uh, it may take a little while to explain, but um, you can take my word for it. This is something I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm more than willing to, uh, to pledge for sure. Um, there's no, there's only going to be 21 million Bitcoin, uh, no more, no matter what happens, uh, it, it does not get affected by computing power at all. So the computing power has increased quite a lot. Uh, the difficulty for mining Bitcoin has also increased proportionally. The difficulty adjusts to the mining power. Um, so it's all, all, all automatically adjusted or relatively automatically adjusted by the network protocols. And um, there's, uh, um, the, hard, the hard cap is very hard. Um, there's never going to be more. Okay, that's interesting. I also want to go back to another point that you were discussing with Anthony and you were talking about Bitcoin being a better form of money and then also the role that government, governments can play. And China's obviously pioneering the creation of a central bank digital currency. How, and I guess this also kind of ties back to what you're saying about Peter Thiel and centralization versus decentralization. How do you think that the central bank digital currency would advance China's interest? And do you see this happening in the short term? Yeah, I think in the short term, they definitely will be, um, I think we're already witnessing the central bank digital race between different countries and China already have a version of it running. Um, it's, it's already out. Um, they're piloting, testing it. And, but the daily trading volume is 300 million US dollars equivalent like a couple of days ago. So it's, it's still pretty small for a country. It's, that's a pilot test. Um, but um, it's, 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 not, it's not super small from a scale perspective. Um, I do believe the first iterations of central bank digital currencies are all going to be relatively centralized. So they're going to be issued by a central party. Um, they probably do have unlimited supply. Uh, they probably do have a lot of restrictions on how you can transfer, who you can transfer it to. If you transfer a large amount, they may be a uh, they may be a source of uh, wealth, source of funds. They may be like uh, questions being asked. So all the traditional KYC AML procedures may be applied to 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 the first. Uh, first iterations of central bank digital currencies. Um, I think that would be the most logical thing to expect. Um, so in that sense, even though most of them are gonna be using blockchain and encryption technologies that's very similar to uh, Bitcoin or other crypt cryptocurrencies, but the fundamental properties of those currencies are gonna be somewhat, uh, are gonna be very different. So I don't think that, I don't, I don't, I don't see any government coming out, uh, uh, coming out with Bitcoin 2.0 just yet. 
So, um, but I think over time we'll see, look, um, uh, today, given the small penetration of cryptocurrencies, um, uh, most people are still more comfortable with, most people still may be more comfortable with a government issued currency, which they, that, which they grew up using. So that may get some adoption, but over time, I, I personally really think that the true digital currencies, the, 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 the true limited supply, decentralized, um, uh, 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 no re uh, fewer restriction uh, type of currencies will get the highest adoptions. So if a central bank digital currency is well centralized, wouldn't that give the governments more power over you know, data and looking at flows of money? Wouldn't this almost do the opposite to what a true cryptocurrency should be trying to achieve, that decentralization aspect? Yes, um, I agree with that. So um, with a digital currency, the government actually have much more control, especially like uh, if they force KYC on every address that you generate, they know exactly who you are, which, which transactions you have received, everything's, uh, everything's in one place. Whereas today, going through different banks, trying to get the record, I mean, the government have, have their ways to get it, but it's, it's, um, they built a lot of system to do that. Um, but it's actually quite expensive and quite um, uh, labor intensive uh, to do. Um, whereas with the with the digital currency is actually much easier to do. So um, that is actually a huge risk for uh, for that. So, um, but at the same time, um, so uh, uh, most uh, people, uh, depending on which country you're in, some in, in a lot of countries, people are able to choose which currencies they wish to use, um, and. Um, um, so uh, the more uh, it depends on how much surveillance, how much uh, how much of how much less privacy you get. Um, if those things are become bigger problems, people are are less likely to use it. So um, there's the balancing effect of that. So uh, we'll have to see how that works. Mm, no, that's really interesting. And I guess if you're looking at sort of countries and, and digital currency, and then you look at institutional investors, I guess you must have quite a lot of oversight as to trading activity with Binance. To, to what extent are you seeing the institutional investors being involved in the cryptocurrency space? And how have you seen that evolve, you know, in the past few years that you've, you've been with Binance? Yeah, I think over the last three years at Binance, we've seen a lot of institutional participation now. So initially, uh, in the early days, it was more retail driven. But uh, in the last couple of years, we've seen a lot of institutional uh, investors come in. Um, we have not seen a lot of the big names come in, like the top tier uh, investment banks, like the, I don't know, Morgan Stanley's, uh, et cetera. So we have not seen those guys come in, but we have seen a lot of um, uh, other institution, uh, institutional traders in, uh, uh, in our space. And the Binance users only represent a small portion of the sort of a crypto users, um, guys who like who actively trade and guys who want to use a centralized exchange. And um, there's, there's a very large number of people who don't use centralized exchanges and we don't really know what they do. But I do think the institutional participation is definitely there already. Mm. And if you were an institutional investor, how do you think you would view cryptocurrency, if you're looking like an asset allocation, would you see it as a currency or would you see it as like a venture investment? How do you sort of see that fitting? I guess in, in your view, it seems to be a, a currency replacement. Uh, yeah, to, this is one of the difficult parts of uh, classifying what, what Bitcoin is or what, what, what cryptocurrency is into either if, if it's an asset, if it's a currency, if it's a commodity. Um, so I think uh, my uh, recommendations don't, uh, we got to classify cryptocurrency into its own asset type uh, or asset category. Um, it, it can act as a currency, it can act as, as a, sometimes uh, they have that they, uh, Bitcoin probably does not have this, but other cryptocurrencies may have properties that can be associated with securities. Um, uh, others can be associated with uh, commodities. But uh, uh, so uh, Bitcoin could be, or cryptocurrency could be any of those, um, but it's much better to classify them into a, into a different thing, um, a, a brand new category. But I think instead of uh, what, what we call this category um, is less important than uh, what properties does, does it have? It, it does hold value. It can be used for uh, as, a, as a medium of exchange and um, it can be used as an investment um, uh, uh, asset type that appreciates or actually fluctuates in value. Sometimes it appreciates, sometimes, sometimes it, it, it depreciates. Um, so uh, it does have a combination of those properties. So um, the, the, uh, the, the, 
the smarter sort of investors, they understand this. They they don't try to over, they don't try to classify Ford into a type of horse. They just say, look, it's, it's a it's a transportation system, uh, we can use it and uh, um, and let's invest in it. So that's kind of what they're doing. That's a great quote. I'm going to use that in future. Ford is not a type of horse. Uh, we've thank you so much for answering all these questions. You know, giving Anthony and I a, a real cryptocurrency 101 training session. Just one final question. From my side, I know you mentioned you've you've lived in all these different places. You seem to be a complete workaholic. It's obviously a twenty four hour business. What really motivates you to keep going? You know, day in, day out for twenty four hours. Yeah. So, for, like for me, I think it goes back to our mission. Um, I mean, I could retire. Um, I'm financially. Uh, I, I've reached financial freedom. Um, I could relax on the beach and uh, sip martinis all day, or I could play golf or do what do whatever. But I think all of those things will be boring pretty quickly. Um, I think I'm actually very fortunate to be in a place where I can actually contribute to increasing the freedom of money for people all around the world. I don't know how much I can contribute to that, but the, um, but I can I, I can contribute to as much as I can, and that's the opportunity that's uh, really really hard to come by. So I really value that opp opportunity, and I think this is really the most meaningful thing I can do with my life. So I wake up, I'm working, or I'm I don't really call it work; it's just part of life now. So um, yeah, um, I'm really lucky that I have this opportunity, and uh, yeah, so I just do what I what I should do. That's amazing. Well, if you ever do just want to give it all up and sit martinis and play golf, Anthony and I will be more than happy to join you. Could do you. that once in a while. Yeah. <laughs> from my side, it's been- I was just thinking, I, I was just thinking it, you know, maybe the reason why I, I'm, I'm, I'm not as successful as you see, you know, I was just thinking about how great those martinis taste and how, <laughs> how nice that would be on the beach. But in all nah. seriousness, thank you. Thank you so much for uh, explaining your vision and giving people around the world confidence in uh, crypto and uh, your proselytizing of this uh, currency, I think it's very valuable to our global society. So just want to give you a very big thank you for all that. Thank you, Anthony. And, th and thank you, Rachel. So uh, thanks for so much for having me. And thanks everybody for watching or listening to, to, um, to, this, to this show. Yeah, thanks.